Hello, everybody. We are here today to talk about network automation. And the question that we're really asking is, am I the only one not doing it? Are we the only ones not doing it? And we're very excited to uh, take your questions today and to get into what I'm hoping is a heated discussion about this today. So on that note, I first want to introduce Corey Quint. I'm actually going to let him introduce himself, but uh, he's joining us here today. Thanks for joining us, Corey. Who are you? A pleasure. I fix AWS bills for a living. I also shoot my mouth off on the internet about large cloud providers, mostly AWS. I spent about 15 years as a sysadmin turned SRE, which is the same thing, except one gets paid more than the other. And I did a brief stint as a network engineer. I have thoughts, opinions, and even a little bit of data. We'll see how that plays out. Ooh, that's going to be really interesting. And uh, Phil, you're also a um, a network expert joining us. Tell us about yourself. Well, you flatter me, first of all, but thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I'm a, I'm a the director of technical evangelism at Kentic, which means I go forth unto the world to proclaim the good news of Kentic and what we do. Uh, but prior to getting into technical marketing, I was a traditional, I say that with air quotes, right? Traditional network engineer for about 15 years, working in mostly big enterprise organizations for VARs. So I was all over the place. And uh, really excited about this topic in particular, because I remember it all over the blog some years ago, and uh, that, that was a big part of my life. But uh, yeah, tons of experience turning both a physical and virtual wrench uh, and troubleshooting and building and designing and working with POs and quotes and all those kind of things. I also have lots of opinions, but I have no data to back any of it up. I, I uh, pretty much just make it up as I go. <laughs> I, I think that's I think that's a little humble, but but. This is going to make for an interesting conversation between someone with all the data and, uh, and someone <laughs> with admittedly no data. So um, I'm Rosalind Whitley. I'll be your host. Um, I was a systems engineer a long time ago. I have worked in, in DevOps and kind of around the infrastructure space. And I work in product marketing now. So I'm the director of product marketing at Kentic. And um, I am really excited to get into network engineers' heads and understand how they think through these problems and how they think through these trends um, and the perspectives that they take on them. So that's why this conversation is super exciting to me. And so I've been thinking about, um, can I click to the next slide? Can I do it? Do I have the power? Yes, okay, great, thank you. So, um, yeah, when I think about network automation myself, I do think about it from a more of a soft, software operations perspective, or I think about automation from a software operations perspective, because a long time ago, like Corey, I, I was a sysadmin, that's how I started. And since I started working with the network engineering community, specifically, I've, I've heard heard about this stuff we call network automation or even heard it called net DevOps, um, but it's kind of a phantom presence almost. I definitely hear about it more on the marketing side, but I don't often hear our customers talking about it. So I'm, I'm curious about a few things, like what tools are we really talking about here? Uh, what, what tools have kind of evolved um, over the years as, as, as tools have evolved in uh, automation tools have, have evolved in other parts of the stack. And also, um, like what's the value there? Uh, is there, is there value there? And are people being left behind on that value and kind of what are the consequences of that? But I think before we get into those kinds of things, I also just want to know, is net DevOps even real? Like, is that a real thing? What do you what do you think about that? That's where I want to start this off. I think that we like to smack words into ops and turn them into jobs. And I think that it doesn't go very well. But I, I was OK with being called a DevOp because if I could either, you know, I could fight it and rail against the tide or I could shut up and take the pay raise. So I went with the second option because I'm extremely self-interested in that particular respect. Uh, I think when it comes to network automation, we're talking about different things and past each other, unless we're very careful. Uh, network automation works great in a pure cloud environment where everything is done with Terraform or cloud formation, if you make poor choices. And, and that sort of ties things together. In the real world, 
Well, I spent a lot of time doing this in the Dark Ages, where Rancid, which is a terrible Perl script, was state of the art. You would it would effectively log into all of your network devices on a schedule, uh, grab the config, and check them into Subversion because this predates Git. And it would then tell you what had changed since the last time it ran. And this was great because since everything was configured via human beings logging into it, it helped solve the, okay, what changed and during what time slice did it change? And that was basically state of the art. Have things progressed significantly past then in, in the on-prem world? That's the you question. Kendrick, have, you should know the answer to that. Rest, right, Corey? I mean, the thing is, yeah. you just explained how you automated a task. So network automation has value. And whether we use the, the name Net DevOps, because that kind of is more alluding to this concept of applying those DevOps workflows to how we manage a network and network operations. So I get it. There's some architecture there for sure. But it is a different way to approach it rather than flying by the seat of my pants, configuring devices on a CLI with, you know, over SSH or uh, on a console cable um, and, and doing that box by box and trying to figure out and doing show commands. So I think there is a tremendous amount of value in in automating and making those mundane tasks, uh, you know, happen automatically. And uh, whether it's just starting with things like doing a diff, like you said, and looking at configuration changes and, you know, how does this uh, inventory files and things like that. Um, but the, the network does lend itself to a lot more difficulties, I think, than other parts of the infrastructure. So if we can brought it to IT operations, you remember, you remember like back in the day, folks were using like Puppet and Chef to manage like Windows and Linux and things, right? People have been automating infrastructure for a very long time. It's not a weird thing, but for some reason, it's not take. It hasn't taken off, I think, to the extent that we expected it to, specifically in hardcore networking. That's really interesting to, to bring that up because I used to work at Puppet, right, right, Phil, and I actually had a kind of a question about that. Corey, I'll let you go in a second, but I think that configuration management itself. Maybe Corey, you can fight with me about this. Configuration management is kind of one step above. <laughs> what we were talking about before, which is just automating scripting, automation to log into your devices and check the status and things like that. Configuration management is like, you have a desired state. And then maybe a step above configuration management is like configuration generation. And does that exist is one of my questions, but I'll let you let you take Phil's question where you wanna take it to, Lori. I was a traveling trainer for Puppet and I wrote part of SaltStack. I have opinions on these things. And, and I think the accepted way of viewing it, at least over in the computer side of the world, has been that you define a state that the systems ideally converge to. Uh, do you go that, do you do that declaratively? Do you do that imperatively? The smart move in many cases to do both, but ensure that you have something that, that adjusts to a common baseline. The problem with doing this on the network is, well, first, there, you don't, to my understanding, have a whole lot of the same testing frameworks available. If I blow up a virtual machine, we can laugh about it, and that's awesome. If I blow up a core switch, for example, suddenly all those computers just became effectively expensive space heaters till it comes back on. That's and right. if I don't have a realistic uh, out-of-band management network to go in and fix it, I'm driving across town or calling the smart hands, which is doing a lot of heavy lifting in some cases over at the data center. And... I know that I've done a lot of firewall changes where I'll have a cron job set to fire off in 15 minutes to revert the change I just made to avoid exactly that drive. Mm -hmm. People are very careful about this the second time. Mm. Right. And that's because the network is the, the actual substrate. It's the mechanism that delivers all these applications. So everything is mission critical. You wiggle the wrong wire, you take down the Chicago office, right? So it has a different level of impact than I think a lot of other uh, components of, of IT kind of as a broad, in a broad brush strokes. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, somebody's asking, like, how do you define net DevOps specifically, right? Raz, if it's okay, if I jump into that? Yeah, I was just going to try to get you to answer that. Yeah, yeah, like, that's a tough one. Know? So good luck, because I remember trying to answer that, not just me, but an entire room of about 300 people in New York last summer. It was, uh, what was that? Net DevOps days, right? Which is now part of uh, uh, the Network Automation Forum and Autocon. We well, know it's real because it has a conference. What's that? We know the term is real because it has a conference. That's right. It's real because it has a conference with sponsors. So uh, that being said, we nevertheless discussed it for half an hour as a group. People raised their hands and offered things. There were PowerPoint slides. What is Net DevOps? You know, very nebulous, ambiguous answer. You know, it was basically applying the things that we know in DevOps, applying the, the workflows that we've used in other parts of the infrastructure to the network 
which you can't do perfectly because again, you don't fail fast, fail often boldly with the network, you know, especially if you're managing a, a hospital system, we, right. we don't, we don't do that. We're very risk averse there. Um, but it is, a if you're not your product, your successor will be. Yeah. Right. Resume generating events, but, but it, it is applying those processes of, uh, do we have inventory files and configuration management and lists of devices and all those tools in place where we can automate certain tasks. And, um, and then, and I, and I do differentiate automation from orchestration, but let's just stick with automating, you know, basic tasks. Imagine just grabbing interface names or circuit IDs from interface descriptions that you have on a bunch of routers all over the place. You can automate something like that without blowing up your network. So there you go. Or um, automatically updating configuration files when a new network device is added and it you know, populates. So you, there's a lot of things that we can do to make life easier as a network engineer that is akin to the DevOps world there in you know, the net DevOps concept. But you know, routers have bugs. They have routing adjacencies and things where if you wiggle something the wrong way and a timer's off, you, you, know, you, you have a, a, data center, a data center outage or something like that. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my answer to Dave who asked about how do I define net DevOps as far as like SDN, wasn't that the magical thing? You know, I, I haven't heard anybody talk about SDN in like five or seven years. Where did that, where did that go? 15 years ago, it was the thing that was going to change everything. But on mm -hmm. some level, haven't we sort of seen that already? I mean, I've been playing mean? around with Kubernetes in preparation for a talk I'm giving on Friday mm -hmm. and it's handling an awful lot of building its own network devices and doing things that, that make some level of sense to someone, I'm sure. But it's it's effectively a closed system. I, To my understanding, it can integrate with actual F5s. I want to slap expensive load balancers in instead of the free ones that actually work mm -hmm. and don't cause power bill spikes. That there are a bunch of different options I can go with, but it, it effectively is a self, ideally, a self-healing environment. Now, does that mean that I'd want to extend that to my core switch? I don't know. That's going to have some problems as time goes on. We're also going to see some interesting weird stuff if you let the cluster's BGP interface with the rest of the world's BGP. That's <laughs> if, your, if your upstream does not wind up uh, tamping down Spurious route announcements, suddenly, you know, no one gets to go to YouTube today. Yeah. But but isn't that also what we do in other parts of tech? I mean, we have automated tasks to manage mission critical things. So I wonder if it's okay that we're automating things that are related to the core switch into our you know big data center firewalls and the big. Has iron. the state of testing evolved? Because that, it well, used to be no. the uh, the screen test with networking. Yeah. Basically, you make the change and listen carefully to see who screams about it. Whereas, at least yeah. theoretically, when we're talking about uh, systems themselves, well, okay, great, you can write automated testing around that. And it's a legitimate question: Are is there are there testing frameworks for network changes? Because I haven't heard of any. I'm sure they well, are, I mean, but I've there's the I concept of network it. modeling that exists. Uh, but there, there's a there's that's a very difficult that's that's an expensive endeavor, right? That's that's not a trivial thing to do, and to model your entire production network, and even then, it's not your production network. They might be, um, you know, every element of your network is represented in math and functions and an algorithm that you run. So it, you know, you have the permutations that give you an idea of what's going on. But that's that's not something that like you know the the hospital in my area where I live in New York can do. That's that's tremendously expensive, a huge lift, and I'm trying to close tickets right now. So what do we do for testing? Nothing. You're right. We have our production network, and and we're very careful about it. Which which goes back to what I said. That's why we're hesitant to do a lot of this stuff with network automation, and why I think we are where we are with it today. Not farther along is really my answer. Why aren't we farther along? Because it's not as easy as I I think we thought it would be. However, let's also make sure we're not that. talking past each other here. You're, you're talking a fair bit about effectively end facility networking, where you're talking about lighting up an additional wing or sure. series of offices, potentially. Yeah. I've been talking more in the sense of the core network in the data center, where everything, all, all the servers need to be able to talk to one another. Ideally, it's something okay. approaching line rate. Yeah, and that's fine too. Uh, you know, in fact, there's uh, somebody that mentioned actually it was the same guy, David or Dave. He uh, talked about uh, you know SDN covering virtual and physical network devices, applying I4, I7, centralizing routing. I mean, that's all part of that. So in a data center, you don't necessarily centralize routing because you'd want to have as much of that happening on the device, on box, so it's happening in hardware and and you're getting line rate, like you said. But you can centralize some of the policy that you push down. Of course, that 
introduces other problems. Like, are you running that policy configuration change over the network alongside, you know, whatever. But in any case, um, so no, I think that applies absolutely in the data center where connecting to devices. And we had, remember, intent-based networking. That was that was all about that. You have your data center, you have your reference architecture, your golden figs. This is what this server should be connecting to on these, you know, LACP connections. And you have back in the day, it was ESXi everywhere and that kind of thing. So it was very much the same idea because it is just IP and and TCP IP and, and interfaces and things like that, making sure duplex mismatches don't happen. And, and then auto-correcting. Now you mentioned the self-healing network. I mean, that's, that's another level. That's going beyond network automation into orchestration and maybe some of the stuff that we're talking about um, uh, with like artificial intelligence and stuff beyond scripting. Like I, I did TCL, or I'm sorry for saying this, tickle scripts on box all the time. And that was still automating stuff, you know? I actually had a lot of devices didn't even speak SSH. You were doing this over Telnet. Sure, oh, sure. Yikes. So, Corey, you were talking about kind of, yeah, on the orchestration side, doing things in Kubernetes where a lot of this is software defined anyway. And as long as things are working and you have observability, you, you can, um, a, a lot is automated and maybe that's okay. And it's um, failover is built, built into that. But I think Michael's question in the chat is like, most companies are not in a pure cloud environment where you mm -hmm. can think of every connected device as, device as being a fairly dumb terminal, like we can with those, like we can with those containers and and network uh, virtual network devices. So, it, what tooling exists to make this possible? I think is a really practical question that I'd love to see the the two of you chat about. Like when when you're working with a heterogeneous environment, what tooling can can be practically useful. Does it exist? I've been in my environment, I've been moving up the stack a little bit. And because it you're right, you're talking about heterogeneous environments. If you can if you can wind up pushing that more into software, uh, I've been using Tailscale a fair bit lately, where you can programmatically address all kinds of things. Then from that perspective, the network as such means can this thing get plugged in, get a link, and then bonus points, get an IP address assigned, get itself onto the network and ideally find its traffic through a gateway to the internet. That was, that is the, that is the dream. Once you can do that, then I can move everything else up the stack and then more dynamically address and control that. When nodes show up or go away, I can take events automatically based upon that. The counterpoint to this, of course, is that some wit on Usenet said many years ago, uh, a host-based firewall is kind of like a seatbelt that lets your forehead touch the dashboard. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is that, um, you know, we're not, we're not talking about, um, necessarily just making it easy for everyone to like, not, you know, one of the things I'm going to go back to something I saw at a, it was like a meme or something, and it was about how network automation, we do it so we can make a life easier and all these things go away so we can do other work that we want to do. And I always find that odd because I'm thinking to myself, like network automation is just allow, it's freeing me up from some of those tasks. So that way I can like do other work that I don't want to do as well. So like, what, what is the point of all this? And, um, and, you know, a lot of the same tooling that exists in infrastructure, we don't necessarily have that available to us on the network side. And so vendors have not only started becoming more open. So when you're talking about hooking into a device that, you know, them opening up their APIs and whatever else, whatever other mechanisms I'm using to connect to those devices and do what I need to do, it's only just now starting. And so we're behind the rest of IT. And so networking is is a different environment. That heterogeneity, heterogeneous nature that you mentioned, Roz, that doesn't exist really. So it does, it doesn't like network blocks though. I might have all my switching, you know, all one vendor and all my firewalls another vendor and all my maybe the SD WAN devices instead of routers today. And the, the data center is all Arista, all my campuses, Cisco, whatever. So I think that we're moving in that direction because the advent of certain technologies like SD WAN has forced, especially enterprise network engineers and, and leaders, it has forced their hand to become a little bit more vendor agnostic, a little bit. So now I don't want to be full vendor A from campus to firewall to switch to, to SD-WAN to everything, all my security. And so I, I am seeing that uh, heterogeneous network that we've dealt with for decades starting to change a little bit as a result. And I think that's opening up the opportunity for, for network automation as well. Yeah. And I think um, we had an interesting kind of follow up in the in the question. He said it's not a question, but uh, more of a follow up. Um, this this guest Dave says uh, from their perspective, SDN now is the combination of 
router configuration management, with virtual network configuration, with network policy enforcement, and network observability. So when you take all those parts together, does that is that an opportunity? Like, is that a tool chain that makes sense in the heterogeneous environment? And what's missing? It depends how you feel any day. SDN is still an ambiguous term, right? Yeah. It's still, it still really is. For a time, it just meant disaggregating your control and data plane and then having some controller somewhere. And that's that's it. That's it didn't really mean that much else. So sure, I, I like I like Dave Deary's answer. That's nice. Um, but uh, you know, centralizing certain components of your network may make sense. Other parts may not, and it introduces new problems. So as far as a grand unified theory, like he said here, um, I'm not sure I agree entirely with with his. Um, uh, with his it also depends greatly upon your constraints. Like I, I started off with my home network, which sounds like a weird example to be going in, but we'll get there, uh, where everything could talk to everything. That was awesome. And then I noticed one day there was an awful lot of crap traffic flying around because IoT devices are ill-behaved. So I, I cordoned those off into their own network with very limited uh, permissions to talk to anything else, and the rest of the network got a lot n uh, better behaved as a result. But by and large, I can still plug into any network jack here in the house and get unfettered access to the internet. That doesn't work in a lot of more lockdown environments. You want nodes to authenticate. Uh, there's, but as soon as that stops working in any meaningful way, your help desk explodes under the load of people calling in to, to say why the internet is broken today. And remember, to users, more so than most computer systems, the network is either invisible or horribly broken. There's mm -hmm. no in-between. Sure. Yeah, but I would say that you can automate all those components as well. I mean, you 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 mentioned a couple of security layers there. We can automate a lot of that using whatever certificates and on box, off box, and things like that. We have the tools to do that, and and a lot of it is just security policy, network policy that is either centralized or or whatever. And and going back to Dave's comment, using using various tools and platforms. He mentioned a few, right, that are management platforms for the most part. Uh, most part, network observability, um, things like Cilium. Obviously, eBPF is what probably alluding to, and high performance routing and, and container and network visibility there. Uh, so all those tools exist. Uh, I, I, I think that what the hang up is, is not that the tools exist. We've had Python for a while. <laughs> Ansible has existed for a while. Those are popular in, in creating those playbooks, Terraform. Uh, in the network space, uh, it's, a, it's, a human, it's a human problem. It's a, I, I, I'm short staffed or, um, you know, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not comfortable doing this. This is a new skill. I went through the, you know, CCNA, CCMP, all that stuff for years and years. I, I don't know this other stuff, so I'm just going to continue to do what I do. Because technically, I think we can all agree, you know, we're on a Zoom thing right now. And, you know, it, the network is working and people are doing it via the command line manually, like with a keyboard. So it is technically an effective mechanism to, to manage everything still. And not a Maybe single attendee had to troubleshoot Trumpet Winsock in order to get here. And I, I think that answers um, part of this question is why is network still in the dark ages? I think mm -hmm. a big part of that too is if I go out today and I found Twitter for pets that in 10 years becomes an S&P 500 component, mm -hmm. at what point between I have this ridiculous idea that may or may not pan out to global multinational company, uh, do I need to start bringing in a explicitly focused network team? And increasingly, that is getting pushed further and further out. What that inherently means is that the network is one of those areas where a growing swath of the engineering world just sort of hand waves over it. They, they know there's something called a subnet mask, and some people won't shut up about IPv6, whatever that might be. It looks like a dump of the thing's firmware or something. It's longer than its serial number. Great. But... People don't really think about this stuff until suddenly they very much have to think about these stuff. Mm -hmm. and, sure. and they make the, the same mistakes. They wind up uh, slicing the 10 slash 8 in US East 1 into five equal parts. And then a six, uh, a, six, uh, VP, a six availability zone shows up and, oh crap, where do we put it? Or I'll give everything a slash 24 and put them right next to each other. And then one has to expand, you're in trouble because network renumbering projects are never fun. And it's all the stuff that people avoid instinctively the second time that they do it. But the first, it hurts. Yeah, you're, you're, you're talking about a, a people problem again, right? You're talking about... Most problems uh, are. What's that? Most problems are people problems. Most problems are. So it's not a technology problem. That's why I don't believe that network automation is stalled or, or at least not farther along uh, because somebody asked, why is network still in, in the Middle Ages? 
I think Corey said the dark ages, which is even worse. Um, it, it's not because of the technology. You know, devices are opening up all over the place. They're 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 seeing that this is a trend. This is a desire. There are small companies now that are that are de delivering um, network automation training and professional services, and they're blowing up in size. You know, I worked for one for a short time, and now it's hundreds of people. And in a very short time, um, there are companies that are out of you know, it's a can platform where they'll they'll automate your network for you right everything gets plugged into it so certainly there is a, a movement in this direction but there's also a reluctance among the traditional networking community but i do believe it's starting to change um you know to answer the question why isn't it where we thought it would be and why is it in the dark ages because it's a difficult thing to move people that are used to a thing and to a culture and to a a, a way of of doing networking and then moving into into this new space it is slowly happening. I see, uh, not that I look for jobs, but I've seen job titles, you know, network automation engineer. Um, and in the job requirements that, yeah, you know, OSPF LSAs and you understand spanning tree and you also can muddle through a Python script. Well, I've never seen that before. That's a new thing. So we're moving in that direction and it, it's very much cultural and, and skills, right? That's what I think. Yeah. Gary makes a great point, too, that when we're talking about a lot of these things, there's not a lot of repetition that goes into it until and unless you have mm -hmm. identical setups in a whole bunch of different offices. Some of the most convoluted AWS-based networking environments have been from companies that had the temerity to found themselves before AWS got going and mm -hmm. put themselves in different physical locations. So they're, they'll have, in some cases, they had ancient T3s still terminating in as the way that some of the field offices would, uh, would, would sink back. So how do you wind up getting all of this balanced out to a point where you everything can speak to what it should be able to speak to? God forbid, we talked about the IP numbering collision issues mm -hmm. before. Recently, I just had to move the gateway interface at home, and that, I, I waited until everyone was sleeping. I dropped the uh, DHCP lease time down to basically nothing, and I still had to basically cut power to the house and restore it because enough stuff didn't pick up the change in a reasonable mm -hmm. time. It's This stuff is hard, but it always feels like the network problem du jour is a onesie-twosie in the world that I've tended to live in. Uh, Gary's right. When you start building this out, and okay, we need a plan for this, with all that respects every office is going to be slightly different but how do you start managing these things at scale it's a whole different problem space that those of us with our heads in the clouds just don't get to play with anymore sure yeah yeah you know gary's talking about moves ads and changes you know once the the network is up you don't want to mess around with it that much there there really isn't much of a need to continually optimize and and make changes uh, the changes occur when there's an ad or you know um you're spinning up a new office like you said a new location uh, or something is broken which is where i think we're going to be going with network automation and ultimately the uh, evolution of network automation into orchestration and then what we're doing with uh, the application of maybe ML models and actually pushing config as a result of the what we've learned from uh, you know machine learning and things like that, and not to get into architecture and smoke and mirrors, right? I'll even make the hand gestures, smoke and mirrors. I think there's some value there. Um, where for a while I, I really did believe it was just silly marketing, um, but now I'm starting to see how we can apply that. And so again, it's not just like the simple scripting um, uh, network automation. It's it's much more advanced than that, but I'm seeing that we're moving in that direction. And, and there is something that I think we can incorporate into that workflow that we can then say, oh, this is net DevOps. You know, now we're using all these tools together because I just don't, I don't believe that, that like you, you mentioned DHCP. That's an automated process. Back in the old days when I learned DHCP, the discover, offer, request, and acknowledge, now it's not the same. And with DHP6, DH, or rather IPv6, it's different. That's an automated process. Somebody wrote that up and it, and it happens automatically. So you don't have to go do that and create static addresses. So we believe in this technology. We believe in it. Um, well, and I, and I do think that... of enterprise IT. I remember back mm -hmm. when uh, a bunch of people got very salty that oh, you know, yeah. cheap little blue Linksys routers had MDI, MDIX AutoSense. So mm -hmm. you didn't have to remember, okay, if this is the uplink, then I've got to go and get a yeah. crossover cable. They just would detect and do the right thing automatically. Like, why can't we get this on our $120,000 Cisco? So sure enough, Cisco back then could react to things in a meaningfully uh, reasonable time period and came out with that stuff. I'm feeling a bit of that now. Uh, Sonic, my ISP here, who's great, uh, told me that if I pay a one-time fee of $300, they'll upgrade my gigabit internet connection here to 10 gigs symmetric uh, for, and then still charge me 50 bucks a month. So what am I going to do with it? I haven't got a clue, but my first problem is going to be getting consumer-grade gear that can do 10 gig Ethernet. Mm. There's not a lot of that out there at the moment. No, no. 
So you, I mean, you mentioned the, 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 the technician, the engineer that had to go change the, uh, you know, change that switch because of whatever, you know, advancements in the hardware technology itself. Do you think that there are folks that are also worried that, you know, this is going to take my job away if we move into this and, you know, my job is going and, and configuring, you know, VLANs on switch ports. That's what I do. And, and other like stuff. Um, if we go in this direction at my organization, I'm out of the, I'm, I'm out of the job and I like my job. So, I mean, do you think that that's a real legitimate thing or, or not really? I'll dive into that in a second. Rosalind, what do you think? I think that, sorry, I was I was um, distracted by reading this question from Alex. So I actually have to look back at my, you just caught me. You just caught me. Um, well, no, the, the question is, is uh, I'll, I'll take a quack at it too, and then you can pile in if you'd prefer. I, I heard Phil say I'm out of a job. So then yeah. I yeah. think, oh, oh. People so, identify. Yeah, like people identify everyone, by the technology they work on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so if everything's totally kind of, if everything's totally automated and this, this kind of made me think about just back to the whole, um, cause again, I'm always looking at this from a software operations perspective. I think there's the more of a, a more thinking on that side of the house that eventually we're going to get, we're just going to get rid of all of this uh, kind of legacy infrastructure. And it's no, it's just, some of these problems that we're talking about over time are just not going to be relevant anymore because eventually i think i think we are not drinking the kool-aid that it's going to be kubernetes that we converge on but it's going to be some kind of orchestrated systematic thing that allows us to um allows us to software define the data center completely and software define network completely but i think that like the reality is that that is um like, I don't think that you're ever going to be out of a job anytime soon, Phil. And I think that mm -hmm. there, there are so many, like we talk about heterogeneous environments. There are also, and you're also talking about every network being a snowflake. Like, yeah, every, every network is a snowflake for a reason. And those reasons aren't, aren't going away. But yeah, go ahead, Corey. Yeah, yeah I agree. It's always been the case. I think that you, you look at the people identify themselves and what they do professionally by the systems they operate on. And at some point, you don't necessarily want to learn the brand new thing. You want to continue doing the thing that you worked on. Uh, I started off my career doing large scale email systems administration. It became clear within the first year that there was a trend toward consolidation among large providers and every company wasn't going to need the email admin. So great. Let me find something else to go annoy people with. And here we are. But there's a, but that was something that was, that was a, a bit of a bitter pill for me to swallow at first. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine what it's like if you've spent 40 years working on the SAN and now you're migrating all of that up to S3 yeah. or the network equivalent thereof. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I agree. I went through that personally when I shifted from being a traditional engineer to being doing what I do now in technical marketing. And that's not just because a technology went legacy or went out of, you know, out of date or whatever. And I had to change. That was just me changing careers. So from a human perspective, that was difficult because my identity was tied to what I did every day, carrying, you know, junk like console cables and stuff in my laptop bag around. That was like a point of pride almost. Um, like so I used I don't to work buy... with a consultant who had uh, like his nickname yeah. was OpenView. I call him Steve. Like OpenView Steve was always where his emails came from. And surprise, surprise, when we did an objective question of dive to see which uh, observability tool we should go with, he suggested we use OpenView when all was mm. said and done. Imagine that I people identify why. themselves by their technologies. Yeah, and, and I, I, so I don't, I don't buy, I don't buy it that uh, you know everybody's scared about losing their jobs. And we have all of human history to look at. That when a new technology comes out, things change. That's that's for sure. You do need to be comfortable with. But not all the individuals change. involved uplift. There's also some generational aging out that happens. Where okay, well, I'll, like no one, uh, no one today is starting their career by learning COBOL or Perl. I hope. Well, if you were to so eventually. State, you are. The, <laughs> Yeah, eventually the, eventually the people who are still uh, who are the specialists on this yeah, right, will right. no longer be the mm -hmm. folks that are that are actively in the workforce by yeah. and large. We we have lifespans. You know, speaking of lifespan, that's actually a good point uh, with regard to the network itself. If I can go that direction. I mean, network devices. We want that uh, three hundred thousand dollar core switch and probably two of them, and then probably multiple data centers and all that stuff. We want our return on our investment. I know, I know the CFO wants to see that 
sit in there and work in production for as many years as possible. We don't, we don't, we don't have this. Um, and I'm not talking about hyperscalers necessarily where they're, they're moving things and everything is white box and they can, they have the compostable infrastructure. Enterprise networks don't typically have that. And so you're going to run that switch for seven years, eight years. I, I remember swapping out uh, Catalyst 6509s that were in there, you know, for the newer model that were in there for 10, 12 years. And it was a point of pride when you see uptime in the, you know, the show version and you can see the uptime. Now, Grant, Granted, it's also a point of shame because that means you never updated your box. But but in any case, um, the, the 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 lifespan or the life cycle, whatever, how long you keep gear in production is way longer, I think, for the network than for most of the other parts of IT. Oh, absolutely. And that's going to play into fast traffic. You know, what not do you care? needing to change. Sorry. Like if I update my computer, things are going to be a lot zippier, faster, et cetera. I'll have more space. But the network. The network is the scapegoat more than anything else when things don't work. Partha says, uh, it is, uh, asked, uh, is a network is guilty till proven innocent? Is that what's holding back networking? I don't know, because I think the problem with that is that you could say the same thing about security. You could say the same thing with IT as a whole. It's terrific as far as scapegoating goes, but we've all, the rest of us like, have all learned to articulate our business value in a way that the business understands. I don't think networking was shut out of that. Now, people intrinsically understand that if the Wi-Fi isn't working, you will not be going to space today. And that is, that, that's mostly become accepted. Yeah, I think it's, it's part of the whole thing. But, and actually back to talking about like, what are these points of pride? Like, trust me, I've, I've been in the war room and I've seen that this is, this is true. The, the network is guilty until proven innocent. I think that, but I almost think that's become a tagline. I hear it again and again in, in calls with, with network engineers that we work with. So I think like holding on to that belief that the network is guilty until proven innocent. I think that is like a thing that it's just like you said, people identify with their tech. People also identify with cultural factors oh, sure. like that. It's a meme now. You're right. And yeah, it's a meme. It's a meme now, but it's more than a meme. It's like it's like something that it's like it's a it's like a rallying cry. It's sure. a it's a yeah. it's a differentiator for this group of engineers. And I think that that's interesting and that's really culture. So mm -hmm. that, that leads me to Alex's question because Alex's question is really, I, I think I can, I can boil this down to like, okay, says we often find um, with clients that while we can easily automate, like the automation is theoretically possible, um, the blocker is, is getting the rest of the team to like fit it into their process that they're used to doing. And, and they've got these like bits and bobs of that process that they, that they want to do, they're used to doing, and they feel are important. And I think they identify with those things too. So can we talk a little bit about sort of the cultural, cultural factors here and what that has to do with folks' identities? Um, and how do we navigate that when it comes to automation? Hmm? Well, the culture of networking is built on the fact that the network is guilty until proven innocent. I, I'm, I'm going to go right back to that because that stems from a couple of things. One, the network is a extremely um, not volatile, but it is the the substrate. It's the mechanism on which everything runs and and everything connects into, and therefore it is highly highly sensitive and apparent when something is broken. So that that statement, which is like a humorous thing, right? Guilty until proven innocent, is because it's that sensitive. And then number two, number two, we like to always say, oh, everybody blames the network. Well, it's because sometimes it is. Sometimes it is the network, <laughs> and something is broken. And so I don't think that. Um, I don't think it's wrong that it's part of the culture in the sense that like, oh, we're all mistaken and we need to correct this, you know, this, this, this error that we have in our minds. Uh, in fact, we can use network automation, um, you know, whether it is just simple things like putting inventory together in Ansible playbooks and, and stuff like that, not even pushing config uh, to, to remediate some of those problems, to make the, the network less vulnerable because of human error. Um, Corey, you said earlier that, you know, most of the time it's a people problem. So what if we can eliminate people from the, the equation as much as possible? Granted, there are people writing these scripts and everything. I get that, but. Um, well, I'm a strong believer that load balancer should not be someone's job title. Sure. But there, <laughs> there's also the side of it where people blame the network for one simple reason. Some things aren't working for them. And the network is the part that people are the first to hand wave away. So if I can't talk to my web browser is throwing a, an error page, it's probably because the network is down. Uh, that also is a triumph, incidentally, of uh, of Google's reliability. You, if you go to www.google.com and it doesn't load, it's probably because your network is broken, not because yeah. Google is down. 
think about there was what it took to get to that that shift in mindset. But yeah, this thing I don't understand, that's probably the issue. I I got decent at networking because I used to work with someone like that. I learned very quickly, you don't show up without a trace route, packet capture, and in some cases using HPing 2 back in those days, but 3 is current, to wind up crafting packets to demonstrate the specific problem. I changed jobs and did that the first time I reported a network issue, and the response was, whoa, 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 you could have just said that there might be an issue, and I would have looked into it for you. Like, well, yeah, but now you know where it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, and thank you so much for that. Right. I, I, I think that um, going back a little kind of tangent to what Alex was talking about there, um, wh what, what is it going to take to get us there? You know, we're, we're sort of we sort of have our hand forced right now because the network is not endpoint computers in a hallway, you know, in offices with an MDF down the hall and some fiber and copper and then a data center and a firewall. Like, it's not just that it is. We are talking about the campus and we are talking about, uh, you know, most of the campus is now wireless anyway. So there's that component um, and uh, cloud. Uh, we're talking about public cloud SaaS providers. We're talking about, you mentioned Kubernetes. So there's some container networking that we have to factor in here. We're talking about all of these components. Um, so we have no choice but to automate some of this, whether it's automating the ingest of telemetry. I mean, I work for an observability company. So that's one of the things that we do is we automate that as much as possible for a single into a single database so our customers can do something with it. Um, but also from a management standpoint, you know, from pushing config, from uh, connecting devices, from automating things to happen. And it is happening. And, and it's also forcing network vendors to be more open, to lend itself to that. Because think about it. If I'm, you know, a network vendor A, think of the biggest ones that you can think of, right? And, and you know, because, you know, you know what's going on in the marketplace that my customers are likely going to connect to AWS or they're likely going to connect to Azure. They're likely going to use this particular connectivity type. I have to make my device work for that or my competitor is going to do that because they're not just connecting over a DMVPN or, or, you know, private lease line, MPLS or like whatever to their backup data center. It's just, it's just not. So Interoperability it's forcing folks, his, folks his hand to get there. Yeah. It's a, it, it's a, tr it's a, tr it's a problem across the board. It, interoperability is, is, has been the watchword of networking almost since the beginning. And you know, like Cisco, for example, tried to push IGRP and EIGRP as a standard, but for some reason the world didn't really go for single vendor specific proprietary protocols for these things. Apple Talk uh, dealt with the same fate in a slightly different expression. So yeah, the network still remains something that, that all comers are effectively welcome. I can't mm -hmm. help but feel some companies view it as a bug. Yeah. But I do think that, that that's that the way we do networking today is pushing, pushing us toward uh, automating more of these tasks and becoming more amenable to, to a vendor agnostic, you know, per perspective because we have no choice. Uh, so it is forcing folks's hand and, and, you know, we're going to see as the next generation of physical, like human being engineers come up there, that's the world that they grow up in. So it's going to be kind of by default. Um, so, so I don't, you know, to go back to the very beginning of our conversation, why isn't network automation where it is? Cause a lot of people got to retire and, and as they start to retire, we're going to see things change, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and I do think that network automation is moving forward in significant steps. We didn't talk about some of the more advanced like orchestration and, and AI assisted things. Um, but we're heading there pretty quickly, I think. Yeah, do you want to do a quick a quick soundbite on AI? So I, I, I'm I'm ready to wrap up this great conversation. Um, but do is there a future? Like is there a future for AI in, in networking? And is it more than this is my same question from the beginning too? Like, is it more than hype? Is it if there's one thing that I desperately want from uh the from a network, it is someone to be incredibly confident but also completely wrong about whatever it is that they're telling me. Because surely that's not <laughs> going to cause any problems. I mean, I'm a mediocre white guy. I don't need the competition in doing that. What's it gonna do next? Start a podcast? I yeah, I yeah. <laughs> I would listen to that. I think that uh I think that we should yeah, look for those opportunities to have practical applications of AI where it's not just asking it a question and then getting, you know, getting a 70% accurate answer. Like are there smaller, more focused? And I think machine learning, like machine learning is happening a lot in the in sort of the network management and network observability space, definitely. Sure. Yeah. But um whether or not generative AI is going to be practical. I think uh, to me, it's still kind of an open question. Well, but. let's talk about the places where it has been working for over a decade in a bunch of areas, and that is anti-abuse. You start seeing significant abuse coming from given net blocks. It doesn't take much to start correlating that and start right. figuring out, okay, this is a pattern that's emerging. Maybe I should flag this for someone. Now, it's the network. It can be noisy. If you're not careful and judicious with that, you'll drown in data. 
But then that's a separate problem, is how do you wind up avoiding information overload and just surface the stuff that's relevant? Otherwise, congratulations, son, you're gonna be reading the packet capture live. Welcome to the worst internship you've ever had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you're right. There is really good automation around that, that, that exists today. Um, yeah, so. and, and beyond automation, because you are adding an element of intelligence where you're allowing right. the computers, the systems to, to to find that correlation that would take a team of MIT engineers to figure out, right, for you. So you expedite yeah. your mean time to resolution. But ultimately, you're you're talking about machine learning. And so that's the that is the actual technical mechanism that AI uses. AI is the broad term. You you right. even mentioned uh, generative AI specifically and not general AI. So we're talking about, you know, looking at a corpus of, of text or configuration or data, you know, whether it's like flow logs or whatever, whatever it happens to be, uh, elements, you know, things, data, and and then looking at it to find correlation, uh, find seasonality, find trends, and that's and then produce some sort of result, and that's that's what we we're doing now with uh, uh, generative AI. Um, and I think it would get more interesting as we start to marry that with the, the with the more general AI, where there's decision making and configuration pushing, and the the self healing uh, component that Corey mentioned earlier. Now that is very speculative to me, but other industries are doing a lot of this stuff. So this is to me, it's almost a silly thing to say like, oh, this is magic. You know, I hate the word magic in tech. Like it's Python scripts and if then statements. It's not magic. But what we're talking, like you, you look at the aerospace space industry they, or, or the medical industry, right? Where they're looking at data to determine if somebody has a certain type of cancer on, and on a probability scale. You know, we, you mentioned 70%. So yeah, there's a, there's a confidence level. We're just applying that stuff to networking now. And why are we doing it only for the first time? I wonder if it's because we never, never just never thought of it. Now, when I say- Look at the old line though, right? that, a, that a computer cannot be held responsible. Therefore, it should never be in a position to make a serious decision. Sure. Uh, past a certain point. Okay, fair that's enough. Okay, we'll there's drive still cars. a tremendous amount of, of benefit that we can derive up to that point. Tremendous amount. Sure. Um, and even certainly if you let a human make the decision, sure. I'm not opposed okay. to that. Yeah, absolutely. And so we're talking about creating like a maybe like an automated root cause analysis kind of thing, you know, th so you're hearing that more. Um, so it wouldn't be all the way down to like the self-healing thing where it's literally pushing config for you, but maybe it does in certain areas. Can I have the it network? The, the AI would agree with my assessment of the network. They, my network design is perfect. The problem is the users. So if we boot all of yeah, them off, true. problems that's true as well. That's true as well. Although, although with security tools, they're doing that where they're identifying a likely threat, right? Because you know maybe they're ingesting threat feeds, they're looking at flow, they see a DDoS attack, whatever, and then they're all, they're automatically, programmatically kicking off a mitigation. So there is that happening in certain aspects. Now I know that's like an adjacent field, to networking, pure networking. We're not talking about routing anymore, but my goodness, we're still doing a lot of that stuff. So that's why I think there's a tremendous amount of value, and and I and I am reluctant to use the term AI, I like to go right to the models and say, we're using, you know, linear regression in order to find seasonality. So we can see that, yeah, your, your AWS cloud bill is going up this much because of this reason here, here's what's been happening over time or identifying the difference, which is difficult for a computer to do, but the difference between something that's just weird and something that's just, and that's bad, that's actually affecting, uh, application performance. You know, like I got a hundred, couple hundred gig links in my data center, active passive, which is a stupid design, but I, they're active passive. One is uh, uh, my, my production. The other one's, um, you know, passive. So it's a backup and it starts to tick up and it's like running at one meg one day, then two megs the next day. It's literally affecting nothing, but you are starting to see a trend and imagine a computer saying, Hey, we're seeing a trend. So there's value there. Uh, and I think we're going to just see that develop over this next year or two as we start to see how can we apply this, what problems can we solve. I am, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I'm also concerned about, you know, the, the square peg round hole thing, where it's like, oh, I got, I got this ML model, I got this LLM, I figured out, whatever, you know, where can I apply this and then put a price tag on it and, you know, a PO. So there is that. I, I do think that there's a lot of there's a lot of useful stuff that that you just touched on and that was kind of a grab bag but you're you're right hmm. I think like I'm excited about I, it that's why I think yeah but I think there are, there's a way to back to kind of the should the human should the human be the one in the driver's seat I think there are ways to build these systems with checks and balances so that like even if you're yeah definitely with root cause analysis the the human's going to be the one kind of taking the reins on what to do with that but mm -hmm. even when it comes to pushing configuration, like I can get a system that derives that that analyzes the telemetry, derives um, the correct, like an assertion of the correct configuration, kind of pushes that to me. Then I mm -hmm. take a look at it, and then I decide like when to when to pull the trigger. And I think that's going to be a really important step. Is like yeah. kind of having all that 
and that, and that is really a chain of like technology that we've talked about all day long that already exists. So mm -hmm. I, I yep. think um, I, we're at a, it is, it's an interesting time. We live in an interesting time and we do have to wrap up our conversation today. I, I think that one of the things I saw Michael said in the, in the chat, a comment, he says, everyone blames the network because they don't understand it well. So this, this conversation was really interesting because um, I, I think I, I don't want to end Phil on your comment about uh, a lot of people needing to retire. So I'm uh -huh. glad like breathe some life into the conversation after that, because I think yeah. it's more than that. It's, it's that, you know, all, all of this complexity and all of this heterogeneity, it, it does take, um, it, it takes a lot of minds coming together to understand, to understand and problem solve around these challenges. And um, I'm glad to hear that, that we're excited about not only where automation is going, but where, where, yeah, artificial intelligence can take us and how that can help our, our human minds to come together and solve, solve some of these problems around complexity yeah. as well infrastructure side, things continue to evolve and, and age out. I would say tech needs to age out more than, more than people, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we'd love to see you all again. And uh, oh yeah, there's our thank you. And uh, you can hit us up on the Twitterverse on, on the web, uh, on the web machine. So come visit us and um, thanks so much for your time today.